Amen. All right. I want to start off the sermon this morning by reminding everyone that we are an independent fundamental Baptist church. We are a Baptist church. We subscribe to Baptist doctrine. Now, a couple of weeks ago on a Saturday, I preached a sermon about not laying again the foundation, right? And I talked about how, you know, we shouldn't be going back and just tearing up the foundation all the time. We should make sure that we are correct about the foundation, lay the foundation, and then move on. And you need to make, obviously it's important, yes, make sure that it's correct when you lay it down the first time, right? But there are people out there that want to continually just question the foundation of things. They always just want to question basic doctrines. And they always want to attack just very core essential things of the faith that are very clear, that are very, and I'm not talking about things maybe that there is gray areas. I'm talking about very clear foundational teachings and doctrines, right? There are very obvious things. I'm not wondering whether or not, you know, salvation is by grace through faith. You know, there are very obvious things that once the foundation's laid, Paul the Apostle warned about going back and, and, and questioning the foundation, relaying the foundation. There's something wrong when you're doing that, right? Now, this morning I'm going to be preaching about something that I believe to be very foundational, that I believe to be very basic, that I believe to be a very clear teaching, and it, and it ties in with salvation. I want to say this also. almost forgot this other little, little uh, uh, pretext point. I want to make this point as well. We derive in areas from Baptist doctrine sometimes, or, or, or deviate, let me word it that way. We deviate in, in some areas from some Baptist doctrine. But do you know where we deviate? We deviate where we say, hey, Scripture teaches something different. The, you know, the majority of Baptists are wrong in this area. We don't deviate, listen to me, just to deviate. We don't question things just to question them. If we study something out, if I study something out and I see very clearly this is incorrect, I don't care who the majority of Baptists are teaching it or they're not teaching it, then I'm going to teach something different. I'm going to teach whatever the Bible teaches, different than what Baptists teach. I would teach what the, I'm going to go with what the Bible teaches. So, is it wrong, you know, to have different teachings than Baptist, you know, as the majority? Of course not, if they're wrong about it, right? If they're wrong about something, if Baptists are wrong about something, there's nothing wrong with going against that. But there's a reason why we call ourselves Baptists. That's what I'm reminding everyone. Because we believe that Baptists are right on most things. The majority of Baptists are right on most areas. We're King James only. Salvation, they're correct on. Just go down the line. Independent churches, right? We don't believe in this hierarchy where there's like a pope or some king at the top that controls multiple different churches. Baptists are right about most doctrine. Now, what I'm going to be preaching about this morning, the title of the sermon is The Sinner's Prayer. The Sinner's Prayer, calling upon the name of the Lord. This is Baptist doctrine. And let me tell you this, this is correct doctrine. This has to do with salvation. This has to do with spiritual salvation, being saved from hell. And it is biblical, it is biblical for a person at the moment of salvation, when salvation takes place, to call upon the name of the Lord for that salvation. And that's what I'm going to be teaching and preaching on this morning. Now I began here in Romans chapter number 10, because there's something known amongst Baptists as the Romans Road, right? The Romans Road. This is how I got saved. Someone preached from the pulpit the Romans Road. And I heard it, and then he took me down and sat me down and went through basically everything again. And do you know where he finished? Romans 10, 13. This is the end of what is known as the Romans Road. This is how Baptists traditionally give the gospel. And it is correct. This is correct. And I'm going to show you here from Romans chapter number 10. I'm going to spend a little bit of time this morning going through Romans 10. Uh, you know, in the, in the beginning portion of this sermon. We're going to walk through it. I'm going to exposit Roman, Romans chapter number 10 very clearly. And I'm going to be doing a couple of things. Number one, I'm going to be, of course, teaching what Romans 10 actually is, you know, a uh, 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 teaching. Number one, but I'm also, also going to be kind of going at it in an apologetic type of way as well. A defense. I'm going to be bringing up some of the objections throughout this sermon because I've heard people many times that are against the sinner's prayer and I've heard many people you know, attack the sinner's prayer and I've heard their objections and I'm going to be showing to you in this sermon that they are incorrect 100%. I'm going to, everyone's going to leave here very, very firmly and understand why do I... Do the sinner's prayer with someone at the end of the gospel. I want it to be extremely clear. I want you to understand very, very well what Romans 10 teaches and why we do that as a church. Just in case one of these people come and try to attack 
the way we operate. So here, Romans chapter number 10, I want to begin with the context in verse number 1. Romans chapter number 10, verse number 1, the Bible says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. What is Romans chapter number 10 from the very beginning talking about? Salvation, the very, very beginning. Now, is this just talking about he desires that they would be physically saved? Because this is one of the things that people always, and this is not new. I've heard this many times, many, I've seen it in many views, you know, or many uh, 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 YouTube videos that I've viewed, where people try to say that every time that someone's calling upon the name of the Lord, it's physical salvation. It's just physical salvation. Right here, Romans 10, chapter 10, verse 1, is this physical salvation? Is he just desiring that they would have physical salvation? No! Paul, I mean, Romans 9, 10, and 11 are all Paul like pouring out his heart about how he wants them to be spiritually saved. He wants them to receive, you know, Jesus Christ as Savior and Israel, the people of Israel, to be saved by the gospel, right? So Romans 10, chapter 10, verse 1, the very first statement says, at the end, that they might be saved. Verse 2, For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant, watch this, of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Is this physical salvation? This is not physical salvation. This is talking about spiritual salvation. It's talking about the salvation of our souls, the salvation from hell, right? Being saved from our sins or being saved... From hell. These people are, the Jews are trusting in their own righteousness for their salvation, right? As, uh, you know, uh, which, whereas we should be trusting in Christ's righteousness. Look at verse 4. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. For what? Righteousness for what? Salvation from, of our souls, right? The gospel. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. believeth. For Moses describeth the righteousness which is of the law that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart. Look at this. Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Now what is the gospel? What is the definition of the gospel? Death, burial, and resurrection. What are we talking about right now? We're talking about Christ coming down to the earth, right? We're talking about his ascension. Then it's in, in his ascension, that is to bring Christ down from above, verse 7. Or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ again from the dead. What's that talking about? His resurrection. So we're talking about the death, burial, and resurrection here. What is this about? The gospel. It's very clear. It's very simple. It's very easy. Verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is, watch this, the word of faith which we preach. That is the word of faith. The gospel, saying what we preach, which is the word of faith, that is the gospel, right? He's talking about the death, burial, and resurrection. And by this, he wishes that Israel would believe and be saved and turn from trusting in the law. Turn from their own righteousness. That is the context. What's interesting, just to show you how double applications take place when a scripture is quoted from the Old Testament to the New Testament, if you look up verse 8, it comes from Deuteronomy 30. Deuteronomy chapter number 30, when God just gave the law to the children of Israel, and he tells them, you know, you know, it's not far off where you have to say, go up to heaven and get it for us, or it's not way over here where you have to say, go over there and get it. You know what he's talking about? He's talking about the law. He's talking about the Old Covenant. When he, make, when he makes that quote in the Old Testament. Now what is this applying to in verse 8? He's talking about the New Covenant. He's talking about the Gospel. Isn't that interesting how he takes the, this scripture when it's quoted about the Old Covenant, the law, and now he requotes it in the New Testament. He uses it and quotes it about the gospel or quotes it about the New Covenant now and reapplies it. So that's interesting. Look at verse number 9 now. This is extremely important. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, I want you to notice that there are, and I'm going to clarify this because people will try to attack me and say, oh, you're adding to the gospel. That's what they always say. You're making it faith plus this or faith plus a prayer, or faith plus that. I'm going to clarify this because these people actually don't, they have a very, a very, it's, and it's in, it, from one aspect it's simple, and then the other aspect I can see why they're confused because there's a lot of confusion out there. They have a, overall a simple misunderstanding of this. 
But I want to ask you a question. How many things are listed right there in verse number 9? Two things, right? There are two things that are listed there. Now, I'm going to clarify this, that there's only one thing you have to do for salvation. But I'm going to so I'm going to clarify this in just a moment where this makes perfect sense. But how many things are listed there? Let's start very at a concrete level. Two. You notice what he says? That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What was a part of that? Confession with the mouth, wasn't it? If you do that and if you believe, you will be saved, right? I want you to look at verse 10 because this gives us a lot of insight on this. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, how people understand this, and I'm going to show you a misunderstanding also in verse number 10, is that, well, when you believe in your heart, you have righteousness. You're saved at that time. And then you confess for salvation. That's not what it says. That's a major misunderstanding. I want you to look at what it says. For with the heart man believeth, look at this, unto righteousness. So when you believe... You're believing unto righteousness, saying you're receiving it. Now look at the second part. And then it says, and with the mouth, confession is made. Watch this. Unto salvation. Not for salvation. Unto salvation. Saying at the moment that you confess, that is unto salvation. Just like it is unto righteousness. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not for. It's not you're confessing and, oh, you already had it at the moment before. They're taking place simultaneously. They're taking place concurrently. What happens at salvation? You receive righteousness. What happens at the moment you receive righteousness? Salvation. These two things are happening at the exact same moment. At the moment that you believe is the moment that you are confessing. And you are, number one, you are believing unto righteousness, and then it's restated, you are confessing unto salvation. It is the exact same thing, two aspects of the same thing that is being repeated. Now I'm going to further prove that to you. Watch how it's summarized, verse number 11, 12, and 13. For, that means, okay, let me explain what I just said to you. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So that means in verse number 11 that that is summarizing what we just read in verse number 10. So at the moment that someone believes and confesses, that takes place instantaneously all at the same moment, right? And that can also be summarized by someone that believes, just whosoever believes. Look at verse 12 now. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. The same, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. That's saying that he'll answer anyone. That means whosoever. What this is explaining is, verse 11 said, whosoever. Sometimes people read over that, but the whosoever there is, is very significant to that verse. Whosoever, and then he says in verse 12, for, the, for there is no difference, saying he will answer whosoever. For there is no difference. That means whosoever between the Jew and the Greek. And he says, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. What is he rich in? Mercy. Saying he'll save anyone that calls upon him. He'll give them mercy. He will save any of them. Now look at verse number 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is that confusing? Or is that super clear? What does the Bible summarize salvation by? We know, and I'm going to go over some verses in a moment, that salvation is by faith alone. But what does the Bible say in verse number 13? And people want to attack just simple, basic, easy. The, the, the context is the gospel. The context is salvation of your souls. The, the, the context is the Gentiles being saved, the Jews being saved, God answering anyone who prays to him, anyone who believes on him. That's the context, my friend. And you know what verse number 13 says? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How does Paul summarize the moment of salvation? What takes place? What does he believe takes place when someone gets saved? That they call upon the name of the Lord. What does that mean? They ask for salvation. To invoke the Lord's name because you want to be saved. Right? That's what that means. To invoke his name. Now why would you be calling upon his name? For help. Because you are in trouble. That's what it means to call upon someone's name. Now, now, this is all important. I hope you understand Romans 10 a little bit better because you notice how it says confess. Confess does not mean profess. It does, I actually have a verse here. I almost forgot that I have that here. Getting off my notes. Leviticus chapter, five, chapter number 5, verse number 5 says this. And it shall be 
when he shall be guilty in one of these things, that he shall confess that he has sinned in that thing. That's the very first time that the word confess means. Can people sometimes think that Romans 10, when it says confess, it means profess. I've said this before, but I've never used that verse to show you. Confess does not mean profess. Confess is an, an admittance of, of wrongdoing, right? When you are confessing the name of Christ, you are admitting that you are guilty and calling out to him or confessing his name in your place to save you. That's what it means to confess his name. That's what it's talking about. You are, it's an admitting of wrongdoing and that's what. What does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? Why are you calling upon his name? Because you are in trouble. You need help. You need to be saved. If you need to be saved, that means that you've done something. You are in a position that's, that's not good. In this case, you are in a position because we're all sinners, right? And you are confessing his name for your sins. Right? Does that make sense to everyone? That's why it uses the word confess and not profess. You, this is you admitting, I'm a sinner and I need you to save me by calling upon his name. That's what that means there, why, why the Bible uses confess. So verse number 13 when it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be, shall be saved. What it is is an invo invoking of the Lord's name, and that is Jesus. You can prove that by verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, that is a parallel with that. That's what that's speaking about. You are invoking the name Jesus for your sins. You are asking him or calling upon his name to save you. That is the whole purpose of that, right? Then, of course, we have the, the uh, uh, process of how someone receives salvation as far as it being brought to them and all of that. You know, and it's actually listed backwards if we keep reading. It says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now watch this, verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of pre uh, uh, peace and bring glad tidings of good things. What are glad tidings? <laughs> The gospel. What does it say they're preaching? The gospel of peace. What is this person receiving? This is not physical salvation. This is the gospel. And you know where it all ends? Where the moment where it, where it comes to a head and the person receives salvation according to Romans 10 verse 13? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. That is the moment of salvation according to Romans chapter number 10. That is the moment where someone receives salvation. Verse number 16, but they have not all, watch this, obeyed the gospel. So when did the moment of obedience of the gospel come in? That's important. Calling upon the name of the Lord. Now I want you to notice that it is an obedience. That's super important. Super important. There is that moment where it is the moment of obedience. Now, obedience... Uh, this ties much in with repentance. And I'm going to go over this very quickly. This ties much in with repentance. Now, it's not repent of your sins. That phrase is never found in the Bible one time. The person that repents the most in the Bible is God. He repents more than anyone else. So if, if the word alone, repent, meant to turn from sin, well then you'd have God a sinner because now he's turning from sin, right? So God, of course, has no sin. So when we see repent in the Bible, we have to look at it in its context to see what it means, right? And a general definition means to change your mind. That's what it means to repent. It means a person has changed their mind, right? And when Jesus went about preaching the gospel, he said, repent and believe the gospel. The Bible talks about obeying the gospel, right? I want you, I'm going to, you don't need to turn there, I'll read to you. I'm going to read a couple of verses you're very familiar with, that the, where the Bible teaches that it, that it is very, very clear that we are saved by faith alone. It's only by faith. Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Most people probably have these memorized, right? Galatians chapter number 2, verse number 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So how are we saved? If you had to give me one word, right, faith. Faith only, nothing else, just faith, right? But here's the thing. People understand what the word faith, misunderstand what the word faith means oftentimes. This is very important. We are saved by faith alone. 
But people will misunderstand what it means when the Bible says to have faith in Christ or to put your faith in Christ. Oftentimes, people think that that just means to just believe that Jesus is the Savior, right? Or just believe the gospel actually is true. The death, burial, and resurrection is actually true. The definition of the word faith when it comes to salvation is trust. It is trust. This is very, very important. This is why people are, are messed up on calling upon the name of the Lord honestly. Ephesians 1.13 says this, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You know what just happened? He said, in whom ye also trusted. Then he repeated the same thing again and he said, in whom also after that ye believed. So that shows that also salvation is instantaneous, immediate. That's very important to understand at this moment. But it also shows that believing when it comes to the gospel is what? Trusting. It's trusting. We knock on doors all the time of people that believe that the gospel is true. That the death, burial, and resurrection actually happened. I mean, every Catholic that I knock on their door believes that. Do you believe? Do you believe Jesus is God? Yes, sir. Do you believe that he died, that he was buried, and that he rose again? Yes, sir. All right. God bless you. I'll see you in heaven. Is that how that works? No. That is not salvation. Just faith in the gospel in that sense. Just faith that death, burial, and resurrection actually occurred. If that were the case, that would mean that the Pharisees were saved. Matthew chapter number 28, verse number 11 says this. This is after Jesus' resurrection. Now when they were going, behold, some of the watch came into the city. These were the people that saw what happened with Jesus rising from the dead. And showed unto the chief priests all things, all the things that were done. What was done? Jesus rose again from the dead. And they saw it and they testified of it with their own eyes. And when they were assembled with the elders... And, and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers. Think about what's taking place. Saying, say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. Why'd they say that? Why did they say, say ye this? Why did they say to say something different than what? Than what actually happened. They knew what? What did they know? What did the, the watch come? He rose from the dead and we saw it with our own eyes. The Jews and the Pharisees knew this. They knew that he had risen from the dead. They understood that. They understood those facts, right? They, they believed that it actually happened. That's the whole reason why they're paying them off. Don't tell anybody about what you saw. They knew that that was the truth. But did they choose to trust in that to save them? Or did they reject Christ? You, have you ever preached the gospel to someone that says at the end of the gospel... I understand Jesus is God. I understand that I'm a sinner. I understand, you know, that salvation is only by faith. That, that Jesus died, rose, died, was buried, and rose again. And all that I have to do is put my faith in Him. But I don't want to do that right now. I'm not willing to do that right now. I'm not at a time in my life where I want to make that decision. You know, I'm just... I don't want to think about that. Have you ever given the gospel to somebody? Like, raise your hand if, some, if that's happened. Where you know that person knows that what you're teaching and preaching is true, Right? And then they just say, hey, I don't want to make this decision. Do you know what they're not doing? Do you know what they are doing? They're disobeying the gospel. They're not being obedient unto the gospel. Do you know what they're not doing? They're not repenting. Now, does that mean they have to change their life, turn from their sins? No. They're not, what they're not doing is they're not turning from unbelief to belief. They're not turning from wherever they're at now, whatever trust they have in their heart, whatever's going on from that situation to the gospel. You understand? That's the moment of salvation. So it's not just the moment when they understand. It's not just an intellectual assertion, right? A mental assertion to facts. That's not what saves someone. When you're going through the gospel and they, and, and they hear, wow, Jesus died, buried, and rose again, and they believe in their heart that that actually happened, that's not what that's saying, that that is the moment of salvation. The moment of salvation is when they choose to trust that. Because Let's say this, what about the, first, the time the first person, maybe that's a Catholic, that's been taught that salvation is by works. And they already believed that salvation was by works in their life, but they weren't aware that the Bible taught the death, burial, and resurrection. What if you showed that person Jesus rose from the dead and they believed it? Is that person saved right then or do you have something else you need to deal with? 
You obviously need to teach them, hey, salvation is by faith alone. And then you know what they have to do? Then they have to make a decision to turn from what they've been taught, to turn from their own righteousness, what they're trusting in, to trust in Christ's righteousness. That's the moment of salvation. Salvation, the Bible teaches that salvation is instantaneous. That's why it's called being born again. You are, that's why the Bible says you are passed from death unto life. It happens in a day. That's why the Bible talks about today is the day of salvation. It's one moment. And you're just passed from death unto life. Do you know what moment that is? It's the moment where you choose. There is a, there is a moment where you receive Christ. Where you choose to trust Christ as your Savior. Do you know what moment that is? That is the moment where you call upon the name of the Lord. That's the moment where you ask Jesus Christ to save you. You know what saves you is the faith in your heart. I want you to turn with me now. I want you to go with me to Acts chapter number 22 verse number 16. Acts chapter number 22 verse number 16. So the calling upon the name of the Lord is the moment of repentance, is the moment of trusting in Christ. It is the moment, listen, where you make the decision that I am choosing to believe the gospel. That is the moment of salvation. That is the moment of repentance. Calling upon the name of the Lord is the moment of repentance. That's the moment where you have made a decision. You have now chosen that you are going to change your mind and you are going to trust in Christ. Now people have, have tried to say, as I, and I've heard this many times, it's, it's recent, it's being attacked recently, and I planned on preaching it just a couple of weeks ago, two to three weeks ago, and, and I didn't get to it. But uh, people recently, of course, have been falling into this, that, that, that it's about you know, uh, uh, physical salvation. It's, Romans chapter number 10 cannot be any clearer. Right. It's calling upon the name of the Lord you are saved. It's the moment where you turn, that's, that's why the Bible talks about turning to God. That's the moment where you turn to God and you put your faith in Him. You call upon the name of the Lord. Now, I want you to look with me here where, where, about, this is Paul, and he is, he is detailing. He is, is, he is basically, uh, in retrospect, telling the moment of his own conversion, of when he got saved. And I want you to notice what it says here. And uh, let's start reading in... Um, We'll, start read, we'll read on pretty earlier. Let's look at verse uh, 8. It says this, And I answered, Who art thou, Lord? And he said unto me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, whom thou persecutest. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said unto me, Arise and go into Damascus, and there it shall be told thee of all things which are appointed for thee to do. And when I could not see for the glory of that light, being led by the hand of them that were with me, I came into Damascus. Now watch this. And one Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good report of all the Jews which dwelt there, came unto me and stood and said unto me, Brother Saul, receive thy sight. And the same hour I looked up upon him. And he said, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and see that just one, and shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men of what thou hast seen and heard. Now, people sometimes will look at this passage and say, Well, Paul, he actually got saved when he said, Who art thou, Lord? Do you know what, you know what Romans chapter number 10 says you have to be doing, number one? calling upon the name of the Lord. And he's asking like, what's your name, Lord? The Bible says that there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. You have to be calling upon the name of the Lord. You have to, be call you have to know that it's Jesus that's saying, saving you. Right? I've heard people say that. Now, what happened there was he, Paul started understanding the facts that Jesus was God. And obviously that he had rose from the dead because he's in heaven right now. Right? When you get here to verse number 14, I've heard people say we had to already be saved because, you know, he says that he had chosen him. Kind of like Jeremiah was chosen when he was in his mother's womb. Kind of like that. Was he saved when he was in his mother's womb? He was already saved at that point? That doesn't mean anything. That's silly. That's, I've heard, I heard that argument a long, long time ago. That's a stupid argument. He, was, he obviously had chosen Paul out before this. He obviously chosen Paul out even before he, when, when he had decided when Christ... You know, obviously God doesn't make decisions in time like we do. But when he came to him and, and the light shone round about him, he did that because he had already chosen him. I mean, it doesn't make any sense when you really start breaking it down. The whole reason he came to him was because he had chosen him. And they would say, well, he wasn't saved then. Well, then that makes no sense. 
So look at verse number 15 now. This is the important part. For thou shalt be his witness unto all men what thou hast seen and heard. And now, I want you to pay close attention. Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. Now, and, and Pentecostals will try to abuse this verse, but it doesn't work. It's, it doesn't work for you, my friend. He said, arise and be baptized. So he wants them to do something. He wants them to be baptized. But then he says this, and, watch this, and wash away thy sins. How? Calling upon the name of the Lord. Amen. I want you to notice that. Wash away thy sins. Is this physical salvation? I mean, get real. This is clearly, utterly, 100%, unequivocally, this is the moment of his spiritual salvation. You know what happened here? He got saved. He washed away his sins. And how did Paul get saved? I want you to think about this for a moment, my friend. The greatest, now we've talked about who's the greatest Christian, right? And maybe you could say Paul, maybe you could say David. Let me say this. The greatest evangelist that has ever lived is Paul. Whether you want to argue about who's the greatest Christian, I'm, I'm going to narrow it down like this. The greatest evangelist that has ever walked this earth was Paul the Apostle. No questions asked. No dispute about that. He is the greatest evangelist that has ever lived. Amen. Ever. Think about this. What does the word evangelist mean? It's a person that preaches the gospel. This is the moment that the, that the greatest evangelist that ever lived, received the gospel. And do you know what the person that preached it to him said? You know how he, he, he summarized this and he told him, hey, this is when you get saved. Do you know what he said? Wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. That's how Paul, the greatest apostle, the, or the greatest evangelist, I'd say apostle for sure too, but the greatest evangelist, that's how he received the gospel. You'd have to say that Ananias preached a false gospel here is what you'd have to say. Do you know what happened? Ananias summarized and said, Hey, wash away your sins, Paul, by calling. He doesn't say by, but that is in indicative of the statement. We would say by. By calling upon the name of the Lord. That's how Paul received the gospel. Right. Now think about this. You get Who wrote Romans chapter number 10? Paul. Do you know what Romans 10 is explaining? How somebody gets saved. Here's the ideal way someone is going to get saved. Do you know what Paul teaches? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Do you know why? Because that's how he got saved. That's how he got saved. Do you know the moment of his salvation? He washed away his sins. you know how? Calling on the name of the Lord. Now, here's the thing. You had, it doesn't matter. If you want to try to take this hard, hard stance to try to say that you're preaching a false gospel by telling people to call on the name of the Lord, you are invalidating Paul's, God, Paul's salvation, his conversion, his own testimony. And don't try to, you know, people always try to find ways out and things like that. Don't try to say like, well, that was what, you know, Paul later received or Paul understood it later. This is Paul giving his testimony many years later. And he's saying, hey, let me tell you about my conversion. And this is what he said to me and this is what I did. So he tells him, wash away thy sins. How? Calling on the name of the Lord. Do you know how you wash away your sins? Not by baptism. Not by being a good person. Not by all this. By calling on the name of the Lord. By asking Jesus to save you. Amen. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Guess what? Shall be saved. If you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved. This is why Paul, when he gets, sits down to go and, and, and tell someone, Hey, this is how salvation occurs. That's how his salvation occurred. That's how he received the gospel. So how do you think Paul went and preached the gospel? You think it's different than how he received the gospel? You think it's different than how he writes to the, in Romans, in, to the Romans in Romans chapter number 10 of, of the steps of all the way to the moment of salvation? Of course not. Do you know what was going on? Well, you know how Ananias summarized how you're going to get saved, Paul? Go wash away your sins by calling upon the name of the Lord. I want you to notice also that there's a moment where it takes place where there needs to be obedience, where you actually need to make a decision. Because you know what he started out with? Arise. Right? Of course, he's also at this same time, you know, being baptized. But what's taking place is he calls upon the name of the Lord, and that's his salvation according to Ananias. Whether he's doing something else with it means nothing. Ananias is very clear that it is his calling upon the name of the Lord that's washing his sins away. You know what he says? Arise. You need to make a decision. This is the moment of salvation. This is when salvation takes place. It's when you call upon the name 
of the Lord. I want you to go now to Joel chapter number 2, verse number 30. Joel chapter number 2, verse number 30. Now I'm going to further prove to you that the verse, Romans chapter 10, verse 13, which is the end of the Romans road, which is where we finalize or conclude our gospel, which is the moment of salvation for those at the door when we're preaching the gospel to them, that it is in fact teaching spiritual salvation. That it is in fact talking about those that do this, that they're going to go to heaven. Those that do this, that they are going to go to paradise. They are going to go to heaven. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 21 is the other place where that is quoted. Acts chapter number 2, verse number 21. It says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It is also quoted in uh, Romans 11 and it's used as delivered. Romans chapter number 11, it's also quoted. Yeah, it's Joel. Joel Amos. Joel chapter number 2, verse number... I want you to look with me at... Look at verse number 28. So the fulfillment of this takes place in Acts chapter number 2, but I want you to look with me at verse number 28. It says this, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my Spirit. So that takes place in Acts 2. But in the very end of the, uh, you know, getting much closer to the end of the world, this takes place. This is at Christ's coming. It says this in verse number 30. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Now, real quick, let's pause. What day is this? This is the day where Christ comes back, right? It is the beginning of what? When He comes back. What starts right when He comes back? His wrath. He's going to be pouring out His wrath, right? The people that are left behind there, are they saved or unsaved as far as heaven hell? Unsaved, right? Those are the people that are left behind for His wrath. Those are the people that are going to endure the wrath of God, right? So the people that are actually taken from this, they are saved from the wrath of God. And this is the same punishment. This is where the physical actually starts to conjoin almost the spiritual. You understand what I'm saying? Because the wrath of God is in hell. The wrath of God is the lake of fire. You understand what I mean? And at this moment, God actually starts pouring out physically on the earth that same wrath, doesn't he? starts pouring out. This is the wrath of God upon those that, you know, in, 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 in uh, uh, 2 Thessalonians it talks about inflaming fire taking vengeance on them that know not God. So that's when the wrath of God begins, right? That's that same wrath. And do you know who's not going to experience that? The saved. Now is this just physical salvation or is it talking about those that are the saints, those that are born again? It's talking about those that are saved, those that are children of God. Now, if you take this verse and try to make this, all oh, that's just for physical salvation, do you know what you have? This is what you would have to say. That at the moment when Christ comes back, right, when He's coming back, that the only people that are going to go up amongst those that are Christians are those that are just physically saved. But that there will also be people that are children of God that are left behind during that time period. That's what you would have to say if you tried to take. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? If you tried to take this verse, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, and make that just, oh, that's just talking about physical salvation. And it's not talking about the salvation of your soul. You would have to believe You'd have to take this, and that's why I said you need to understand that the spiritual at this moment happens to become the physical right at this moment. Because he starts pouring out his wrath upon those that have rejected him and disobeyed the gospel. This is God's wrath being poured out upon the earth, right? You would have to take the interpretation that only those that call, now that, because this is, this is basically the position. I want you to understand. There are pe the people that reject calling upon the name of the Lord. They, they'll say things like, hey, that's, you're teaching works salvation. You should not be saying that. that and, and they'll say this, that happens later. 
And that's just talking about prayer to God for like being physically saved. And that's not the moment of salvation. So if you were to question those people and ask those people, so does everybody do this? Does everyone call upon the name of the Lord like later in their life? I understand you don't, you don't believe that it happens at the moment of salvation, right? If you were to ask them, does everybody do this at one time, you know, maybe later where they're just asking for physical salvation, they would say no. They would say, no, not everyone, right? Because the free gracers, that's who they are, right? The people that are just like, you know, for, if we believe in, in free grace as well, but we understand it properly. We understand calling upon the name of the Lord properly, right? So, you would say, they would say, yeah, you know, not everyone calls upon the name of the Lord. I'm sure they would say that there are people that didn't call upon the name of the Lord for physical salvation in their lives. They would be left here. Number one, saying that, this ha that the people that are brought up to heaven have nothing to do with those that are spiritually saved. The Bible is abundantly clear that this is the resurrection of the just. These are those that are righteous. These are those that are, you know who he takes with him, who he brings with him and takes back? The saints. He comes for the saints. Do you know what the saints have done according to Acts chapter 2, Joel 2, and Romans 10, 13? They called upon the name of the Lord. Looking at Romans 10 in context, you know what those people did? They obeyed the gospel by calling upon the name of the Lord. Looking now at Joel 2, think about this. Who does he come back and save then? Those that obeyed the gospel. Those that put their faith in Christ. How do they do that? By calling upon the name of the Lord. I'm going to prove this to you further. Everything that I just said to you. I want you to go to Daniel chapter number 12. Daniel chapter number 12. So he said, it says there at the great day of the Lord that whoever called upon his name is going to be saved at that moment, right? That's the saved. We know that the saved are who are delivered at that moment. They are the ones that are delivered. They are the ones that are saved. That's who he comes for. Look at Daniel chapter number 12, verse number 1. It says this, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to, the, to that same time. What is that? What's occurring there? That's the, the tribulation and then great tribulation, right? And it says, and at that time, watch this, thy people. Who's thy people? It's the people of God. It's the people of Daniel, his brethren, the real Israel, right? Thy people shall be delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. Now, who is delivered? Those that are written in the book. And who else are they? They're, they're referred to in three different ways. Number one, those that are written in the book. Number two, thy people. So the people of Daniel, which are the people of God. So the people of God are delivered, number one. And then also the people that are written in the book. Now, who's written in the book? Who's written in the book? Saints, people that believe in Christ. Revelation chapter number 3, I, I should have included this in my, in my notes, in my sermon. Revelation 3 is when he's speaking to the different uh, uh, churches, right? And, he, and one of them is, you know, to he that overcometh, will I not blot, out, blot his name out of the book? What's overcoming in 1 John 5? Putting your faith in Christ. That person's not going to be blotted out of the book. So how do you get, let's say this, how do you get put in the book and stay in the book? How are you in the book of the, the Lamb's book of life, according to Revelation 3 and 1 John 5? By believing. Right? Amen. Who's delivered? Here. Those that are written in the book. That's those that are saved or delivered. Joel 2. I realize this is getting convoluted, but we're defining one, one scripture with another scripture. Right? In Joel 2, who did it say was delivered? Those that what? Called upon the name of the Lord. Do you understand how they're being used synonymously? Those that are called upon the name, those that call upon the name of the Lord are delivered from God's wrath. They are saved and resurrected, right? And then over here it says who? Those that are written in the book are delivered, and those that are written in the book are saved from God's wrath. Then we look at Revelation 3. It says those that overcome, they'll be written in the book, right? They're going to be delivered because they're written in the book. 1 John 5 says those that believe are those that overcome. Notice what's going on. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And you know what that's summarized with? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Notice it's one and the same, that they're synonymous. They're very clearly synonymous. Now, I'm going to prove this to you even further. 
and make it extremely clear. Now I want you to go with me to Malachi chapter number 3. Malachi chapter number 3. <clears throat> Malachi chapter number 3. Look at, look at verse number 13. We're going to read a few verses here. It says this, Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord, yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? Ye have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is, the, is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have walked mournfully before the Lord of hosts? And now we call the proud happy. Yea, they that work wickedness are set up. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. Now watch this, verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord spake often one to another. And the Lord hearkened. Then it says this, and heard it, and it says, And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Now look at verse number 17. And they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in that day when I make up my jewels and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. What day is he talking about when he makes up his jewels? We sing a song about this. What day is that? It's the day of God's wrath. What day is that? It's the day when people are delivered. Everyone that is found what? Written in thy book. Or written in the book. He mentions that here. Notice that he uses a specific phrase. He said, Them that feared the Lord and that thought upon his name. Now, what does it mean to fear the Lord? What is that talking about? Every person that gets saved fears the Lord. Every person. That's why it uses the word confess, that why it sa that's why it says call upon the name of the Lord. Every person that gets saved, there is a fear there of hell. Every single person without a doubt. They're calling upon the name of the Lord. They're asking to be saved. Now, however much fear that is, there is a fear there. So notice it says, them that feared the Lord, and then it says, and that thought upon the name. So those that thought upon the name of Christ or of God... They are written in the book, aren't they? Those people are written in the book. And what's going to happen? They're going to be spared from the destruction. They're going to be spared from the punishment. I real, It's a lot all at one time. Roman, uh, Daniel chapter number 12, who's spared? Who's delivered? Those that are written in the book. Joel chapter number 2, who's spared? Those that call upon the name of the Lord. Do you see how it's all culminated and, and it all comes together in Malachi 3? It's teaching the same thing that Daniel teaches and that Joel teaches. That whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, here it says, thought upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. They'll be saved in that day. And those, that is those that are written in the book. That's those that are delivered. One point that you could take away from this too, and I want to make a couple of things very clear, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to a couple of their passages next and just debunk a couple of things real, quick, real quickly at the end. People say, well, does it have to be audible? People that try to attack this will try to find any example. You know, does it, do you, do they have, what about a mute? Huh? Are you saying that, they, that God doesn't want them to be saved? That God's not giving them the opportunity of salvation? It's silly. Do you notice how it's worded here? It says, thought upon thy name. Think about that. Does this have to be audible? You can call upon God's name in your mind. We tell the people this all the time. When we leave, you can just make the decision in your mind and just, you know, call upon His name. Because listen, it's not words that save you. It's the faith in your heart. It's the moment of trust. It's the moment of taking, making the choice that I'm now trusting you, right? It doesn't have to be something that is audible. Also, I want to say this while I'm on that point. Does it have to be like a specific prayer? It's like, if you don't get that invitation over there, and if that person doesn't repeat that verbatim, the prayer that I have on there, they're not saved. They're like, you missed the word. Go back and fix that word back there. Does that mean that they're not saved? That's ridiculous, right? You know what it needs to be? This is it. It just needs to be a moment where the person is choosing to put their faith in Christ. Amen. That is calling upon the name of the Lord. Does it have to be like this prayer where it's like, like specifically directed? Like, Lord Jesus, you know, God, I know that I haven't prayed to you in 10 years. Like, it's like this very personal. No. It, can just, it could be something just like this. I'm choosing to trust Christ. And if at that moment they understood all of the gospel 
and they put all their faith, that's them calling upon the name of the Lord. It doesn't even need to be like, I'm speaking to you first person. That's called, that is invoking the name of Christ. That is, they realize, the reason why they're doing that is because they realize that Christ understands that God is in all places at all times and He knows. He hear, they hear it. That's them making that decision, I'm now choosing to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why do we go through the prayer? You know what we include? You know I have everything on there is all the elements. And I want them, I want to hear them. That's the only reason why is because I want to hear them say the words of all the elements of what you must understand in order to be saved. You know, we, you know, we say on there, Dear Jesus, will you grab me an invitation? Oh, you know what? There's none over there. Does anybody have one on them, actually? Oh, yeah, that's right. So, we point, Brother Hall's got one. Thank you. Oh, there was one over there? I didn't think there was any. On the back, this is what it says. Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. Is that necess necessary for salvation? What if somebody says, I'm not a sinner? Are you, is that person going to get saved? Of course not. I know that I'm a sinner. Then they say this. I know I deserve to go to hell. Don't you need to understand you're condemned and that you're going to receive a punishment for that? In order to be saved, what are you being saved from? Right? I believe that you died for me, were buried, and rose again. That's the gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection. That is asserting, they're saying, I believe these facts, right? Then they say this, I'm only trusting in you to save me. You must be putting all of your faith in Christ and nothing else. Amen. If you put your faith in anything else along with Christ, you're not saved. And if, by, and if by grace, then is it no more of works, otherwise grace is no more grace. It must be all in Christ. Amen. And then it says this, thank you for eternal life. Thank you for eternal life. You know what, why we say that? Because in the gospel presentation, we explain eternal security. Because if you don't understand eternal security, you don't understand grace. Because grace is that you're not earning it, whether it's on this side of salvation or that side of salvation. It doesn't matter where you put it. It's no longer grace. So that's why we go into great depth about eternal life, and we want to repeat that with them. Thank you for eternal life in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You know what they're doing? Calling upon the name of the Lord. That's Jesus. And they're praying to God and they're asking for salvation. Does it have to be that word for word? No. If they understood every element, every single aspect, all they have to do is make a choice in their heart and call upon that name. Jesus, save me. Lord Jesus, save me. Christ, save me. Calling upon Jesus to save them. That's what they have to do in order to be saved. There has to be a moment where you... Where you Put all of your faith and all of your trust in Christ. That doesn't happen when you just assert the facts. People are, even good people that are saved themselves, they'll get confused about this. They'll be like, well, aren't they already saved if they believed everything I told them? Unless they made a decision while you're standing there and you don't know about it, like, I believe all of this, I'm going to, I'm, and that were they, because listen, listen, it's a conscious decision. Because you have to realize, I'm damned. Like, I, you, there's a moment of like, uh, of, uh, of realization. Like, everyone that got saved knows what I'm talking about, right? There was a moment when I realized, as a 12-year-old boy, I'm really, I'm go, I've been going to church my whole life in a Baptist church, and I'm going to hell. I have no idea how to get, that, I had no idea that I wasn't going to heaven. I didn't understand fully, from beginning to end, how to get to heaven. And I realized myself, personally, I'm going to hell. I'm not saved. And I realize I need to repent. I need to believe this. I need to put my faith in Christ or I'm going to go to hell. And you know what I did? I called upon the name of the Lord. That's how I got saved. And just like Paul had somebody teach him, call upon the name of the Lord, you'll be saved, Paul. Paul went out and taught people to call upon the name of the Lord for them to be saved. That's what I do. That's what everybody here, I'm sure, did. There was a moment, if you're saved, where you thought upon His name, where you called upon the name of the Lord, where you chose, I'm putting my, where you're invoking His power, knowing that He will save you, choosing to turn and repent in your heart to put your faith in Christ. That is the moment of salvation. And Romans 10 is extremely clear, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not just Baptist doctrine. It's not just tradition. It's Paul's doctrine. It's what the Bible teaches. It's Paul's salvation, how he was saved, how he received the gospel, and how he preached to other people to be saved. Right. There's a reason why we preach the Romans Road, because it's solid biblical doctrine when it comes to salvation. I'm just not tossing out every Baptist doctrine just because I want to be different. That's not what we're trying to do here. We're trying to be biblically, biblically correct. We want to be as close to the Bible as we possibly can. That's what we're striving to do. 
Calling upon the name of the Lord is biblical. You know the people that are delivered? You know the people that are saved? That's what the Bible teaches. You know everybody who's going to be resurrected? Those that have called upon the name of the Lord according to the Bible. That's who's delivered. Amen. Those that have thought upon his name. There's a book written there in it. Daniel's people, the saints, the resurrected. You know who they are? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's who it is. Amen. It's the moment of salvation. It's the moment of putting your trust and your faith in Christ. There's a couple of basic misunderstandings that people have that cause them to not understand this. Number one, they think that faith is just like an asserting to the facts. And then also, other people are, are, are confused about what it means to, to even repent. Repent, that's the obedience. That's, you heard what I said, now arise, Paul, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. There's a moment that that needs to happen. Amen. That's why there's a moment of salvation. You're born again at that moment. You put your faith in Christ. You can do this to your... You can at the moment where you hear the gospel, you can walk away. You can tell the, the person, hey, I'm, you know, I'm not ready for this right now. And you can walk away in your mind and contemplate, I'm unsaved. I'm going to hell. Everything he said is true. And you can say, Jesus saved me. And if you understood everything, you'd be saved. Right. You've got to call upon that name. You have to call upon the name of the Lord in order to be saved. Go to John chapter number 4, verse number 10. John chapter number 4, verse number 10. Now, here's the thing. Some verses, when you hear them a lot, just like anything, you get acclimated to things, and it starts to lose its punch. It starts to lose its power. There's no way around John 4, 10. You can't, listen to me, you cannot get around John 4, 10 and try to teach that Asking for salvation is works. You cannot. Unless you think the gift of God is works. Unless you believe that salvation is works. That's the only way. There's no way. I don't care what new argument you have. There is no way to get around John 4.10. Sometimes, like I said, you get acclimated to things. You start to get used to things. You've heard verses a lot. And you kind of get used to it. You know, you better go back to John 4.10 because there's no way around it. John chapter number 4, we have Christ preaching to the woman at the well, or otherwise known as the Samaritan woman. He says, and let's, let's, let's read some, verse 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, oh, yeah, we're going to have to back up even further. Uh, let's start in verse 7. There cometh a, a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. We're going to read over it real, real quick and then come back. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the well of water, but I'm sorry, but uh, I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. What is he talking about? Everlasting life. That's what he's talking about. That's what he's saying when he talks about giving her water. He's talking about everlasting life. All throughout the book of John, he's preaching the gospel. And do you know what he talks about? The gift. Do you know what he talks about giving people? If you believe on him, everlasting life. At the moment that you believe, you receive everlasting life. Now I want you to look at verse number 10 again. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink. Watch this. Thou wouldest have asked of him... And he would have given thee living water. Now what is that living water? It's everlasting life. What is that? It's salvation. And do you know what he said it was? He said it was a gift. And what is a gift? It's free. A gift is free. It's free by definition. The Bible teaches that it is the free gift. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. Right? You pay nothing for it. And people say... If you ask for something, that means you work for it. Well, then I guess all these bums out here stand on the ramp are, are working hard for the, all this money they ask for. Right. It's ridiculous. Right. If you, once you've asked for something, well, now that's works. The Bible teaches that's works. 
No, it doesn't, because Jesus, Jesus taught the exact opposite. Jesus said that, hey, if you ask me for something, I'll give you a gift. And he still referred to it as a gift. And you know what it was? In context, it's everlasting life. It's not even just a passage where he defines a gift as, as still being something you ask for. It's actually salvation. So, so not only can you, listen to me, this is super important, not only from this passage can you prove, can you prove that asking for something is not works? That's step one. Step two is Christ is saying, if you want salvation, ask for it. Right. He's teaching that you call upon the name of the Lord, you ask me for it. Amen. You should ask for salvation. That's what he's teaching. If thou knewest the gift of God and who it is that saith that he give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. Amen. That's a gift. And you ask for a gift. Right? According to Christ, salvation is something you ask for. There's no way around this. You can go and try to come up with other verses and whatever. There's no way around it. It's not, you know... It's ridiculous. Christ teaches that you ask for salvation. You want to hear a perfect example of that? Luke chapter number 23, verse number 42, the thief on the cross. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Lord, remember me when thou comest into, my, in the, into thy kingdom. You know what he did? He asked for him to remember him. That's, you know, he, that's what he's doing. He's making a request. And you know what he did? He called upon the name of the Lord. He called upon the name of the Lord. And you know what the response was from Jesus? Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. What does that mean? He was saved. He called upon the name of the Lord. You're going to be in paradise with me. He say, hey, that's works. You better do it in your mind. Don't say anything out loud. That's ridiculous, isn't it? It's work salvation. I don't teach that stuff. That's crazy. It's the same thing he told the, the, the woman at the well. He's just... Just ask for it. It's a gift. And he said, Lord, Lord. This happened to be audible. Audible. Does it have to be audible? No. Does it have to be certain things? Do, you, do we have to? Is that what we're going to put on the back here? Lord, remember me when thou comest into my kingdom. It doesn't have to be the same thing. Because people try to accuse you of these things, right? They'll try to say, oh, you're saying you've got to say this exact prayer. Or you're saying that you've got to you know, do this. You're saying that they have to say it out loud. That means you're damning all the people that can't speak to hell. No, that's why it says, those that thought upon thy name. Yeah, the salvation is by the faith. If you don't believe the words, that's why it says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Because, because that calling upon the name is the moment of belief. If you, this is what it means. If you pray and you don't believe, you're calling for no reason. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Say it's pointless. right? But if you pray and you have faith, you're saved. If you pray, and let's say you have faith that, you know, Christ is God, that he died, that he was buried, and that he rose again, but you're not fully trusting in him, your faith is in vain. You're still not saved. Your, your faith is in vain. It's just like not believing the resurrection. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that your faith is in vain. Right? You have, this faith that you do have is in vain. If you believe that Christ is the Savior, that he died, that he was buried, and that he rose again, the, that faith is in vain. Trusting in your own works, you could even say, is vain. That faith is in vain. There's a faith there, but it's in vain. That's what that would be. You know, you have to put all of your faith and all of your trust in Christ. 100%. And then there has to be a moment of conversion. There's a moment where it takes place. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. That's salvation. Go to, uh, I want you to turn to Acts 10. Let's go through these last couple ones real super quick. Acts chapter number 10. So one of the things, and this is not new. I've heard this before. This is not new. I've seen it recently, of course. This is not new, but people have said, you know, uh, why do you call it the sinner's prayer? What I'm showing you right now, you know, is not something that I heard for the first time. This was rebutted a long time ago when I had heard this. So people say, why do you call it the sinner's prayer? Because God doesn't answer sinners. God will not hear sinners. So that's another point saying that they try to use that to say, well, well, these people can't get saved because God doesn't answer sinners. And they get that from John 9.31. It says this, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. So they say, Now we know that God heareth not sinners. Now does anybody know who's talking, number one? The blind man is speaking. The blind man, it's in John 9, where, where Christ heals the blind man. Number one. So, number one, that's not like this authoritative scripture. Number one. But number two, that's not even what he's saying when it says that, we know that God heareth not sinners. Go and look the context up yourself. Context matters. Context matters. Listen.
Judge not that you be not judged. I don't ever want to hear anybody judge in here ever again. Why is it, why, so you see a perfect example of why context is super important. You've got to go back and read the context, understand things in context. Some verses, yeah, they're just so clear and stuff like that. They, and, and sometimes it doesn't matter. The way that it's worded, you go back and read the context, it doesn't change the point of what's being said. Context matters. Do you know what he's talking about? They're debating. The blind man is saying, he's talking about God hearing someone to do miracles. And they're talking about like, you know, this man is not of God. You know, if, you know, if this, and they give their reasons. And then he responds and he's like, uh, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. He's talking about someone praying to God and to, get, and to allow God to do a miracle or to God to do a miracle through them. That's the context. That's super important. It's saying that God just won't, God wouldn't just do a miracle for anybody. That's the point. We know that some, you could even say the same thing about, it's not even talking about someone whether they're lost, whether they're saved or unsaved. You could still apply this to like some wicked, you know, let's say a prophet of God. If he's living a very wicked life, is God going to use that man to do a miracle? So it's not talking about saved and unsaved. Does everyone understand my point? The context matters. It's saying we know that God heareth not sinners. He's not going to answer the prayer of somebody that's like living in sin. So this is proving that he's trying to prove like what type of man that this is. That he's a man of God. That he's a prophet. That's actually what it's about. And not only that, it's not scripture. You have a blind man just saying this. That's important. And people hang their hat on this like, he's not going to hear your prayer if you're a sinner. Well, that actually defies other scriptures. Number one, we have everything we saw so far. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul was a sinner when he washed away his sins by calling on the name of the Lord. You could go one after another after another. Acts chapter number 10, verse number 1, keep, uh, read with me here, it says, There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man and one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. He saw in a vision evidently about the ninth hour of the day an angel of God coming into him and saying unto him, Cornelius, and when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and call for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodges with one Simon a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. He shall tell thee what thou oughtest to do. Now I want you to... Uh, everybody's familiar with this story, right? You know why he's calling for Simon Peter? What's the reason why? Come and preach him the gospel. He comes in and he says, I didn't have this verse, but it's over here like near verse 22, I think. Where he tells him, words whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Maybe it's back further. Uh, where's it at? Anybody know? The end, it is the end of 22? Oh man, I was... I overlooked that. I flipped over like verse 35. Okay, verse 22, it says, Cornelius the centurion, a just man, and one that feareth God and of good report among all the nation of the Jews, was warned from God by an holy angel to send for thee into the, his house and to hear words of thee. Then called he them and lodged them, and on the morrow Peter went away with them, and certain brethren from Joppa accompanied him. Now it's further down. But he comes in and he very clearly tells them that he's preaching to him the gospel. He's preaching words. I believe this is the passage where he says, Whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. Either way, if this is that passage or not, this is where he comes in. This is indisputable. Everybody, you can look this up in the context afterwards. He preaches to him the gospel and he gets saved. The whole purpose that he called for Simon Peter to come was for because there was he didn't understand the gospel all the way. He wasn't trusting in Christ. He was trusting in his own works. He didn't fully understand the death, burial, and resurrection. But, no, but that's not the, specifically the point. Obviously, you must understand that he's not saved. But I want you to look back at ver chapter number 10, verse number 1. And it tells you there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius. And it tells you a devout man and one that feared God with all his house. Then you go down. Verse number 4, And when he looked on him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he said unto him, Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. The chapter teaches this man is not saved. The whole reason why Simon Peter comes is to preach him the gospel. And do you know what that says in verse number 4? Thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. And they say, God won't hear 
they take the blind man and they're hanging their hat on the blind man's words and, they're, and then misunderstanding it on top of that and saying, God doesn't ever hear. He won't answer any prayers. So how are they? You must have faith first before you pray to God and he'll answer any prayers. That's not what happened with Cornelius. Cornelius was unsaved and prayed to God and it says that his prayers were heard by God. And because of that, God sent him someone to preach him the gospel. So you got a little bit of a problem there. Not only that, you got a problem with, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I mean, that's the biggest sore thumb for you, is that you're calling on the name of the Lord to be saved. It's very clear. It's very obvious. Um, now, I want you to go with me, and we're going to end here in Luke chapter number 18, verse number 9. Luke chapter number 18, verse number 9. Did anybody find that? It's not a big deal. But I would have liked to have read it. Luke chapter number 18. Look with me at verse number... Verse number 9, it says this, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. So who is this about? It's about those that trust in themselves, as opposed to those that trust in God. That's what it's talking about. Look at verse number 10. To men, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee, that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I hope he was at least not praying out loud, like this publican over here. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, look at the humility, like he won't even go all the way in. He's standing way off. Would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. Why do we bow our heads when we pray? To show humility to God. Will, uh, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Look at verse 14. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. You got one man who's a Pharisee, you got one man who's a publican, also known as sinners. Right? The publicans and the sinners. You know what happens? The sinner comes in, the Pharisee comes in, they both pray. The sinner prays. He prays understanding what? That's why we call it the sinner's prayer. Because two points. Number one, you know, you're a sinner, but number two, you're realizing you're a sinner. And notice the sinner's prayer. God be merciful to me, a what? A sinner. And he's, while he's smoting upon his breath. You know what that is? That's the sinner's prayer. And you know what happened as a result of that? He received justification. Amen. He was justified as opposed to this other guy. So you got two points there. God heard that man's prayer, the sinner, and the prayer is what justified him. He prayed. Amen. Now was it the words of the prayer? It's the faith in his heart. It's the faith in the words. It's believing what he's saying. It's taking an idea. See, it's so silly when people are like, yeah, of course it's not the words. It's actually believing it. Believing the concept. Words are just concepts, right? And we preach to you, when we go to your door, a concept of the gospel. We explain to you what you must do, and then you, in your heart, put your faith in that concept, and that's what saves. Now, does it have to be audible? No, you just have to have faith in the concept. You have to understand it, and then put faith in it which is Christ. You know what happened here? It's the sinner's prayer. And the sinner got saved. The sinner was justified by, by what? By his faith and asking for salvation. Please justify me. Now, notice the words. They're not exactly what we say. Are they? No. But he's saved. Just like the thief on the cross, right? Now, there are tons of other times that call upon the name, name of the Lord is used in the Bible. Tons of times. Now, let me say this. Most of them are physical. They are. Because calling upon the name of the Lord is just asking for God to help you. You do that at salvation, of course, you ask to be saved. 
But that's not the only... I call upon the name of the Lord all the time when I need help. But I call upon the name of the Lord to be saved too, buddy. I call upon the name of the Lord in my life when I need help or I'm in trouble. Yes. And I'll give you a, 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 a tip as well too. Those, most of those take place in the book of Psalms. And when you look them up, just like Psalms all the time is real deep, it has multiple applications, he's oftentimes mentioning hell. Call upon the name of the Lord, hell. Why? Because yes, it's his physical salvation, but you know what it's figurative of? It's figurative of spiritual salvation. It's very clearly figurative of his soul being saved over and over again. He talks about, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the sorrows of hell compassed me about. The sorrows of death compassed me about. And he talks about, I'll call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. You want to have another example of this? When Christ goes around healing people, he's what? He's healing them and he says, thy faith has saved thee. That's physical salvation. But you know what it's meant to be a picture of? Like leprosy. The man that has leprosy. Leprosy in the Bible is figurative of sin. And they'll, he'll heal them by their faith. That's a picture of like spiritual... Does that mean those people are getting saved like spiritual salvation every time? No, of course. Maybe some of them did, but they're saved and probably a lot of those were already saved and then this is just their faith that he could heal them, right? That's, so you have the figure, but then you have the actual what's literally going on there, right? You know what those people do oftentimes? Like the blind men? They're like, thou son of David! And you know what he does? He heals them by what? Calling upon the name of the Lord. In the figure. You understand? You have this happen numerous times. Where do you know what they'll do? And do you know what he'll say? To them? They'll call upon his name. And they'll say, Lord, this, this, this. That happens so many different times. Where, they, where they'll make a, a statement. Lord, this, this, this. And this is figurative, of course. And then he'll say, thy faith hath saved thee. But guess what they did? They called upon his name. And he's like, thy faith hath saved thee. Because they're the same thing. Because it's the faith in the words. You understand? It's believing what you say. It's the, yes, it's not the prayer itself. But that's the moment where they made the decision and they trusted him. So it's at that exact moment that that takes place. This is the sinner's prayer here in Luke chapter number 18. And that man, because of, because of him calling upon the name of the Lord, was justified by the prayer. People, I almost forgot this. I meant to mention it earlier. This is all the very last thing I'm going to say. People will say... Well, what about these passages that talk about they labored in prayer? They labored in prayer, right? Okay, prayer can be labor. If you laid up all night praying, that's labor, okay? If you're like crying out to God what Jesus was doing in the Garden of Gethsemane, they says that that's laboring in prayer. Yes, that's late. That doesn't mean that every time that you, if you just say, Jesus, save me, that that's works. But can it get to the point where you're just like, you're in sweat. You know, the Bible distinguishes from those when Jesus says, Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Learn how to rightly divide the Word of God. Don't ignore some verses and then... You need to rightly divide the Word of God and have an understanding of this verse and an understanding of this verse. Because someone labored in prayer doesn't mean that every time somebody prays, they're laboring. That's very simple. That's, that's very simple-minded. It really is. It's extremely simple-minded. You need to... Uh, that doesn't mean when somebody says, Jesus, save me. It's like, that's work salvation, buddy. You're a heretic. That's ridiculous. You know, that's someone asking for salvation. You know, the thief on the cross wasn't working when he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He's like, you better stop doing work over there. <laughs> I can hear you're struggling when you said that. That's stupid. That's ridiculous. You know? You know, it's, it's very, it's, the Bible's very clear. Let me end with this. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Psalm chapter number 116, verse number 13. I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, that salvation is